YouTube. YouTube. And now I'm going to share my screen. Can you see my full screen? Yes. I don't I can't see your heads nodding, so you have to tell me. We can see it. You can see it. Okay, perfect. Uh, okay, uh, we are two minutes after uh, 6.30 in the Netherlands, and I'd like to open this autumn school. Thank you so very much, guys, for being here. Um, uh, we can see people from all over the world. Um, of course, we have a lot of people who register and they, they, they don't uh, show up. But I think uh, 100 people, uh, more or less, in the room, uh, that's wonderful. Uh, we are here uh, for the Autumn School Planning and Design for the Just Transition. I'm going to speak for five minutes only, right? Um, and then I'll give the floor to my colleagues. Um, so welcome. You are very welcome. We are very happy you are here. And we hope we can have uh, meaningful uh, conversations with you and, uh, and learn together, right? Don't, don't be afraid to talk to us, to ask questions and to interrupt sometimes, uh, not too often, but uh, to interrupt us sometimes and ask questions. Uh, this uh, autumn school is organized by two uh, schools of the TU Delft, the uh, Delft University of Technology, and these are Baukunde, that's the Dutch name of the School of Architecture and the Built Environment, and the Technology Policy and Management School, TBM. So these are two different schools at TU Delft. And um, it's funded uh, by the Delft Design for Values Institute. That's, um, that's uh, an institute dedicated to exploring um, design uh, values in design. So they want to know really how values impact and how can we design for values. That's very important. Um, this is our building. Uh, it's a very beautiful building that we have occupied um, um, 10 years ago, I think uh, 12 years ago, when our last building burned down to the ground. So this is an old building that we, we have occupied now for some time. And you are most welcome to come here and visit us. Um, we are located in the Netherlands, in the city of Delft. I'm actually talking to you from the city of The Hague, uh, where I live. And that's more or less where we are in the northwest of Europe, just you know on the other side of England and uh, where it is quite uh, soggy and, and rainy. So something to think about. Uh, our city is very beautiful. It's a, a little bit of a fairy tale uh, city in the, in the center. Uh, if you go to the outskirts, it's not so fairy tale anymore. It's a, it's a middle-sized city with lots of history. Uh, the city itself was uh, founded in 1246. And here you can see the canals and the, you know, and the and the polders uh, of the Netherlands, typical landscape of the Netherlands. And as I said, it has a lot of history, and it's a very beautiful city. Maybe you've heard about it, connected to the painter Vermeer, who was uh, a native of this city, right? And uh, unfortunately, uh, as I have uh, said several times, it's not always sunny. Uh, sometimes it can be quite uh, cold and, uh, and uh, rainy here. But we are here uh, for, for uh, our uh, autumn school. And why do we have it? Why do we want to, to, to have such a school? There is an urgency that we all know about. Our world has already heated up more than one degree centigrade. And that one degree was is responsible for extreme weather events 
that are making our lives in, in our cities more and more uh, difficult, right? For, for people all over the world. It, it doesn't matter where you are, you are affected by it. A little bit like the pandemic, isn't it? Um, of course, we have things like the Paris Agreement that uh, wants to keep um, you know, the, the, the heating uh, uh, up to two degrees. And uh, actually there are very good news coming from COP26 uh, in Glasgow, Scotland, um, uh, about uh, a, a global corporate tax and, and uh, concrete steps to, to, to make to decarbonize our economies, but we, it remains to be seen how things will play out. We know that, um, for example, the United States got out of the Paris Agreement with uh, Donald Trump. It's now back with, uh, with, um, with Biden, but, um, but um, we uh, still have to see how uh, all these very different countries, right, in Africa, Latin America, Asia, Europe, North America, how each country will respond. Um, there are also good news from COP saying that um, uh, a few countries have committed to really stop investing in carbon, in carbon, um, in oil and other carbon-based uh, energy. So that's very good news. Uh, we are uh, experiencing a success, a successive systemic shocks. I don't have to tell you about them. Uh, the um, the the uh, climate change is only one of them. The other is the pandemic. The other is uh, maybe we can talk about growing inequality. We can talk about a lot of systemic shocks that are affecting us. And none is as important and as uh, harmful as the crisis of rationality that we are experiencing, right? This crisis of rationality comes from uh, a, a a myriad of sources of, uh, of causes, uh, but people are losing faith in science and that's very, very serious. We know that only 6.7% of the population of the world has a university degree, uh, which makes us, most of us are in the university, not all of us. I know that some people are uh, professionals and they're not at the university maybe, but this makes us quite uh, responsible. We have a special responsibility in this uh, scenario to, to try to illuminate people's heads. In light of uh, several problems, well, uh, we know that the world is more than 50% urban, but hello, uh, the other 50% is not urban. India, for example, is urbanizing at record rates. The urbanization of India is one of the biggest um, uh, I, I think uh, challenges, um, Africa is urbanizing at record rates and so on. China has urbanized quite a lot in the last few years, but there is a lot to, of change to be done. While um, uh, we have that, well, 50% of humanity is still rural. Many of them still want to move and to enjoy the, the uh, prosperity of cities. So people are moving not always uh, willingly, not always because they want to move, but sometimes there are wars that make them move. And we are uh, experiencing more and more environmental migrants. So people who are forced to leave their homes because of some um, of uh, extreme weather events or, or uh, things going badly with our agriculture and so on, right? So where are we going? Where are all these people going? Are they going to, to places like this? Or are they going to places like this? I think both are undesirable. Uh, we need to make better cities for everyone, right? So the transition to a decarbonized economy is urgent, but will it be fair? That's the question that this um, autumn school wants to answer with you. We need a very big transition to sustainability, which is urgent, but we also think it needs to be fair. Right now, uh, the, fair uh, the fair distribution of burdens and benefits of development doesn't exist, right? We see 
lots and lots of uh, poverty uh, of people living in inhumane conditions all over the world and something has to be done. So we can't think about future generations uh, very well if we don't uh, think about the generations of, of, of people here and now. Uh, so we know that the European Union, for example, has a, an European Green Deal that is uh, based on two pillars, financing the transition and the just transition, leave no one behind. Um, and uh, we are based, uh, we are basing our school on this idea of the just transition, leaving no one behind because we have only one world. We have this one world. This is all uh, we have. That's all the resources we have, isn't it? And we as a global community have to take care of this world. And the word care will come back quite a lot in this uh, school, I hope. Um, with this, I finish my presentation. Let me stop sharing. Uh, well, maybe I, I I just want to tell you that, um, uh, wait, I want to, what is Elon Musk doing on my screen? I want to finish this, um, wait. Um, I, I'd like to um, welcome you again and invite you to apply for the for the summer school that we have in 2022 um, uh, at our school. Uh, that school is really amazing. We uh, we receive 100 people, and I know it's very difficult to come to to Europe for a lot of people. It's very expensive. Um, the courses here are, are expensive. We have a few. Um, we have a few um, scholarships that we would like you to explore and to apply for the summer school in 2022. But for now, I see we are 161 people. Oh, that's amazing. I give the word to Jose Carlos. Jose Carlos Canizares. <laughs> Okay, hello. I'm pleased to be here also. It's an honor. I'm happy, really excited to be with you. Um, let me... Here. No, <laughs> this is not the... This one. Yeah, we can see the... Um... We can see the screen with the, no, the, the folders. One. Okay, here. So many different versions of the same presentation, you know? <laughs> Rupsa from Delft in the Netherlands, uh, welcome. Okay, do you see it? Um, uh, I see uh, only your screen, the, the computer screen, like uh, the, the, we can see the folders. We don't okay. see the presentation. Jose, shall I give the introduction while you uh, find the file? Yeah, please. No, the, the file is there. I, I just couldn't uh, share it appropriately. Okay. Oh, there it is. Yes. Okay. Sorry, guys. I, I, I uh, Maybe uh, Carissa speaks first. I don't know. Who, who was going? I'm fine. Uh, if you see the screen, right? Yes, we see the screen. Okay, so this session uh, is called Designing Climate Resilient and Just Cities. Uh, we are going, uh, Carissa uh, Champlin and I, Jose Carlos Cañizares, I'm going to, to give you a brief introduction to socio-technical resilience, uh, uh, theoretical introduction and the second part of the session, we will play a, a game, an exercise, where we will illustrate, you know, uh, complexities involved in um, building resilience, in choosing resilience measures, especially with regards to uh, the justice issues that they can raise and how can we can address them best. Uh, so I will start by some comments on conceptualizing and contextualizing what urban resilience is about. Many of you will by now have heard about 
resilience. Um, in the last two decades, this term has become increasingly important in uh, many scientific fields. And it also has become an organizing principle for many huge initiatives related to the urban transformation to climate change, urban adaptation to climate change, or urban transformation in general, such as the ur new urban agenda by the promoted by the United Nations Habitat, or uh, the 100 Resilient Cities pioneered by the Rockefeller Foundation that you see there. Uh, so resilience is, resilience is now moving lots of money and efforts on the ground. But the question, of course, is what, what is really resilience? And there are many views about that. It's a complicated field. But he, we will draw on a view that comes from ecology, um, sees resilience as a property of complex systems related to their ability to withstand uh, shocks and stresses or to adapt to them. Uh, this is the view that has been more, has become more influential in the context of climate uh, adaptation or urban adaptation to climate change. Uh, and I'm going to introduce you a little bit to some peculiarities of this view with a brief video um, that explains some, some aspects of it very well. So, Here it is. We can't hear the sound very well. No? The sound isn't so important. So I can just explain here, you can see a shock on the ball, which is a system, represents a system, um, but it goes back to its, its uh, normal state from an ecological perspective. Um, you again have your system represented as a ball <clears throat> and it has an equilibrium, but when a shock impacts that system, it may reach a tipping point, go past that tipping point, and reach a new state of equilibrium. This is a second definition of resilience. From a socio-ecological perspective, then we look at widening, let's say the space of our uh, equilibrium. So now again, we have a shock on the system, the ball. It looks like it stopped. And then here you see the tipping point has moved. So these are just a couple of uh, examples of how you can see uh, resilience uh, um, differently. And many different dif disciplines have their different definitions of uh, resilience for the systems that they research. Uh, sorry. Garis, I couldn't hear a word of what you said, but were you uh, hearing the video? Uh, or it was only playing for me? No, Carissa was uh, narrating the video, so we, uh, we didn't hear your, your, uh, your sound, but uh, I don't think it's a, a problem. No, uh, the sound is on, it was only emotional, you know, like <laughs> nice song, but... Uh, well, uh, Perhaps it will be redundant, but I wanted uh, with what Carissa said, which I couldn't hear too, too well. But nonetheless, I would like to, to briefly review what we just saw. The video showed that resilient systems uh, have two or alternatively three different aspects. Uh, the first two are alternative. And they are, constitute different views of what resilience is. One of, one of them is that the resilience resilient systems can recover efficiently. The other says that they, even if they can recover efficiently, but they at least are able to maintain their critical functions. Um, the third view is complementary to the second one or even to the first one, which is the idea that resilient systems are also adaptable. However, as you saw in the video, resilient systems are those that adapt at least in part by shifting tipping points, the video said. Oh, it's also very, 
uh, said in the literature that they, these systems can control the, the stability landscape. What this means is that when resilient systems are fa facing inevitable transitions, at least because they are resilient, they can postpone tipping points, that is control when change happens, um, turn abrupt changes into less abrupt ones, that is control the speed of change, and in some accounts, they can also manage uh, or direct the system to states that are more desirable than others. Uh, that is control the direction of change. Now, after these comments on these views of resilience or these three aspects of resilience, it is perhaps more obvious where resilience has become so important as a strategy for urban climate change adaptation. Now, in understanding what urban resilience is, let me go to the next slide, if I can. I cannot go to the next slide. How should I? Jose, you probably have to go back to that. Uh, you have to click on the presentation, and then you can go to the next slide. It's because you're... OK. Is it okay, right? Yes. Good. So um, to get into what urban resilience is, we need to understand, of course, not only what resilience is, but also how we can understand cities in the context of climate change. And there are, of course, many different views of what a city is. Um, cities have been understood as, you know, the entanglement of human stories, as the background of human interaction, as centers for the uh, production and accumulation of, him, of capital. But the, an understanding that has become increasingly common in the context of resilience and resilience thinking is the one that you see there. That's a very significant uh, popular uh, definition in the literature that understands cities in, as complex systems. That is uh, as um, systems of systems or systems where many networks are connected and that operate at many different scales from the street to the global financial system. Um, and these authors also have proposed, proposed an integrated view of urban resilience where both uh, the three aspects of resilience and this understanding of cities are combined into a coherent view, which is pretty much in line with the um, the view of resilience and the measures, the game that we will play later. Okay, uh, as you can see there, there are three aspects of resilience which are highlighted in, in red. Those are the ones that we explained before. And the third one is the one that stands for the long-term aspect of resilience. That is the idea that resilient systems would be able not only to adapt to the immediate conditions, but also to in, source, in, 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 some, sort, in some way provide for Mm, along the long-term conditions for future resilience of the system. Of course, that makes resilience more closely aligned with the idea of sustainability, but nonetheless, we will explain some parallels and tensions between these concepts later. Now, uh, I think this is going to give the ground to Carissa, right? Uh, Jose, um, maybe we keep your slides and you can just click to the next. Yeah. Um, tell me when yeah. to pass me. Yeah. Can you click for me? Yeah. Okay. Right. So I'm um, picking up on this concept of um, cities as um, complex interdependent uh, systems. Uh, if we pick one definition um, commonly used at the technical universities that we work at um, here in the Netherlands, um, like the TU Delft, uh, we can look at the city as um, a, yeah, a complex uh, yeah, meta system that consists of a number of urban subsystems. Um, from the engineering perspective, we often talk about water systems, en uh, energy, the built environment, agriculture, cyber systems, and transport. And um, obviously these systems are, are not uh, isolated. They're highly interdependent on one another. Can you uh, go to the next slide? Um, so when we talk about resilience, we often talk about the of what, uh, which would be the system that we're um, specifically interested in or the uh, system of systems. 
and we talk about the two what. So when we talk about the two what, we are um, talking mainly about uh, what we call shocks and stresses. Um, a very well-known stress um, that we're all very familiar with by now is, of course, climate change. Um, climate change and other chronic stresses um, can have intensifying um, impacts on um, shocks. So they're very interrelated, um, the two concepts. Uh, shocks, on the other hand, are um, um, disasters, other sorts of um, more short-term um, spontaneous things oftentimes um, that can have an impact on uh, your system. And both of these are increasing uh, in terms of severity and of, uh, in the case of shocks, uh, in terms of frequency. So here you can see in the illustration that uh, as we have a warming planet, uh, more long-term uh, frequent stresses are occurring, um, but also it's uh, really uh, making our summers hotter, for example, and we're having um, more instances of heat waves in cities. Uh, and of course, there are a lot of negative uh, implications for uh, people and uh, infrastructures in our cities. So um, can you um, go to the next slide? Yeah. Another uh, important interdependency we look at um, is the interdependency between our urban networks or our systems um, with one another. So um, as we move uh, in uh, many countries towards um, smart, well, they call them smart mobility concepts, um, we see more dependency on energy and, um, and uh, cyber networks. Um, the same thing in the Netherlands, um, cyber networks control our dam system, which protects us uh, from flooding. I think about 40% of the Netherlands is actually below sea level. So um, if our systems fail, uh, we have a massive disaster in uh, the second most um, high density country in the world after Indonesia. I think we still have that, uh, can claim that. Um, so here's a, I wanted to show you an example of two types of interdependence. Um, well, what this does is these interdependencies of our networks, while they in some ways can make us more resilient, they can also make us more vulnerable. So um, in the first example where you see these, um, these networks, this is all, uh, this is a simulation of um, telephone networks um, during a disaster. So in the orange network, you can see that after 24 hours, a lot of, um, uh, a lot of uh, phones have died and people cannot get critical information that they need in order to cope with uh, the disaster. Um, in the SOS simulation, um, researchers at TU Delft are looking at uh, one in particular, how uh, we can actually use this um, inter interconnectivity um, to actually prolong um, battery lives of our phones in order to um, keep people better in contact over a longer period of time, therein increasing uh, our resilience uh, to a shock. But as you can see in the other picture below, um, because of our hyperconnectivity of our cities, um, if, for example, we have a, a cyber attack on our, um, on our um, telecommunications and internet systems, this could shut down a lot of other systems in our cities. On to the next slide, please. Uh, you can typically classify shocks um, in three categories. We have natural shocks, which are quite well known, I think by now all around the world, flooding, um, um, global, the um, pandemics, uh, earthquakes and droughts, but we also have uh, human induced shocks. So uh, technological shocks like cyber threats um, and um, breakdowns of our, um, um, our systems, which I mentioned previously, radiation and poisoning, oil spills, uh, all these things obviously have, um, can be shocks on our systems. And of course, there are the socioeconomic um, shocks that we experience either through um, failures in our financial systems or crises, um, massacres, social conflict, uh, wars, uh, all of these uh, belong to um, different types of sho shocks, although you could argue that um, some of them pro go become so prolonged that they start to look more like, um, like uh, um, stresses. Next slide. So uh, what can we do about this? Well, uh, what we, uh, 
what we uh, do in uh, what society often does is uh, governments re, um, informed either by uh, oftentimes by researchers, ideally also by citizens, is we look at those type, types of governmental and engineering and societal measures that we can take in order to uh, cope with our shocks and stresses. So in the top graph, you can see that these stresses over time are slowly just wearing down um, our system. Um, but if we enter, um, implement countermeasures, um, they can have different effects. And that's where you see the line going up again, but in different trajectories. Uh, in the graph below that, you can see a shock happens once, you have this abrupt um, decline, but again, you implement the different um, types of measures that Jose mentioned previously, adapt, adapting, mitigating, recovering from a shock. And then you have a different um, path of uh, um, the, um, recovery. And then on the right, you can see it is uh, the first week of COP26. So you can see here um, in the case of uh, global warming, um, the same thing happening. We have um, um, different trajectories of uh, how um, climate is uh, changing, temperatures are rising, and um, there are all sorts of things that impact um, the projections. And one of them, again, is uh, the measures that we can take, we will take, we are taking, or we aren't taking in order to change uh, um, our future. Uh, when we talk about, oh, sorry, this is your slide, Jose. I'm going to hand it back to you. <laughs> this is me. <laughs> you're you're on mute. Well, uh, I'll do it myself and mine. Uh, resilience, of course, means some things we explained, and the context of resilience. Uh, is the one that Karis explained, but what does, how, how can we flesh out this idea? How, the, how does it come to practical measures or strategies? Well, there are a few ideas that, that are commonly understood as proxies of resilience or factors or qualities of resilient systems. And among these ideas, three of them are very, you know, featured in most accounts. Um, which are those of redundancy, flexibility, and diversity. And below, you can see cards of the game you will play later uh, that more or less exemplify these three qualities. For instance, in energy systems, we have a, a measure, typical measure for building resilience is building redundancies, that is providing uh, energy through different uh, and possibly better independent means through different systems. Um, floodable promenades, uh, which comes to stand for flexibility and then adding infrastructure with particular functions that comes to stand for diversity. That is by adding infrastructure with particular functions, we avoid again uh, bottlenecks when some of the infrastructures clash, for instance. Problem. Well, problems is that for all the, the good that these measures or other measures, uh, resilience-based measures may sound, uh, for all the desirable things they can bring to our city or some subsistence of the city or most of uh, the inhabitants in the city, they can also have very negative impacts on some people. And there are many reasons why this might be the case. But in recent reviews of uh, uh, case studies uh, uh, about uh, work performed in the Asian Cities Climate Change Resilience Network, uh, uh, in, the, in the article that, I, that we sent you or we shared with you in the folder, in the common folder, uh, we see two very interesting ones that actually stand for a broad spectrum of issues. On the one hand, resilience measures can in themselves have justice trade-offs. For instance, some household can, households can build boundary walls that directly affect their neighborhoods, their neighbors. And that's especially the case when the neighbors don't have the ability because they are poorer to build their own boundary walls. And another thing is that we need to pay really 
a lot of attention to social, cultural, and political realities. That is, even though our resilience measures can be tuned in order to avoid undesirable damages of all sorts, in order not to damage disproportionately anyone. Still, how they will be embedded in their cultural context, in their political context, that matters a lot. Sometimes political realities don't allow for implementing uh, measures as you would like. Um, here we have an example that the local leader in India, in Indore, had no interest in solving the water issue a problem with drafts. So, because he already solved that problem for the people he was interested in, the people who was going to vote him. That, or of course, resonates with examples you, you saw also in Roberto's booklet uh, about the zoning in American cities in the 30s. You know, these are not direct friends of the leaders who were in charge of the zoning, but were, of course, the people who th th that they were interested in catering in, in catering to. So, or who or in catering to their interests so uh uh of course resilience measures can be of course uh dependent and will be often dependent in the political realities where they are embedded creating injustice eventually in another article that we shared with you uh the the authors provide an extensive amount of uh different justice issues that are arising uh eight cities, uh, if I remember well, uh, that can relate to the provision of infrastructure, to how people are included in the planning process, uh, to land use regulations, or to how the role that the private, private sector has in, in resilience building. Uh, this is just to illustrate that issues can come in many forms, uh, issues with justice. Um, Another way in which we can see this is by uh, fleshing out a little bit of the conflict that exists between resilience and sustainability. Of course, resilience and sustainability can be aligned and are aligned in practice in many ways. For example, both principles or goals in general promote a concern for ecological issues in urban planning and in design. But then building local resilience by no means uh, will will mean that automatically our cities will become more sustainable in fact resilience building measures can increase greenhouse gas emissions or, or carbon or carbon footprint or on or dependence on external resources and actually as you see in the quote there some resilience measures are clearly in conflict with sustainability for instance if you read sus sustainability uh, how to interpret it in planning or in design as the need to avoid inefficiencies in resource management and in uh, providing infrastructure, uh, then of course that's in clash with the idea of redundancy. And conversely, if we are interested in, pro, um, in building uh, resilience through redundancy, then we are in clashing with the idea of sustainability. That's why Nathan Borg, for instance, in the article, another article that we shared with you, asks us to take into account, especially the trans transformative aspect of resilience, that is in order to look for the longer term. And ask questions not only about how we can be resilient now, but also in the future and eventually be aligned with sustainability. So what we have more or less spoken here about is three kinds of justice issues that can arise and um, they are summarized in the table. On the one hand, we have distributive issues that relate to how some decision or measure is going to impact on individuals and communities. What are the what is the balance of costs and benefits or of risks and of risks and opportunities? Um, and of course, we may interpret this idea in various ways. Uh, we may want to protect the most vulnerable or even to benefit them. We may also consider the need to not, not inflict disproportionate or very serious damage on anyone at all, not only the most vulnerable, but, but anyone in the city. But, but also we may be interested in limiting trade-offs between sectors, population sectors or areas of the city. Um, there, is a, there is also procedural justice, which concerns not so much the outcomes of interventions, how they will impact uh, different balances of 
risks and opportunities for different people, you know, but uh, also who participates in them, who, is, who has a say in deciding, in prioritizing, in making decisions related to shaping uh, the, the measures. Uh, of course, those issues are very interrelated because if you are not included, you don't have a say in a decision-making process, it's likely that your needs and your vulnerabilities will not be taken into account. And the third issue, of course, it's also related to this, as Roberto mentioned before, which is the, the one about intergenerational justice. How will our measures impact on future generations? Oftentimes, future generations are impacted just because their parents, their predecessors were impacted. That is how poverty passes you know, down the line, essentially. But we now are, of course, when asking intergenerational questions, often re, uh, referring to the problem of sustainability. That is how we are affecting, how are we affecting the natural asset base of a population or of a country or of the whole humanity? Uh, are we foreclosing future options for development? Are we, that is, uh, disabling uh, the ability of future generations to decide uh, and change their development options? Um, and that, that is, for instance, uh, what the Brundtland, the, the definition of the Brundtland Commission asked us to consider in the sustainable, uh, regarding sustainable development. So basically, that's, I, I, uh, I'm done here. And I think that, yeah. yeah. Thanks, Jose. I'm, I'm going to take over from here um, to introduce you um, to the activity, the exercise that we're going to do uh, for the rest of the um, session. But um, Jose, do you think you could uh, stop sharing uh, for a moment? Because I think uh, it would be nice, as uh, Roberto suggested, to uh, take any questions uh, at this moment that uh, people in the audience have. Uh, so I, I just want to to highlight a question from Inti. From um, uh, she was asking actually in the beginning about uh, the problem that uh, resilience has about being fair and unfair. Sometimes you have situations of extreme unfairness in which people are resilient, but it, you know they live in poverty, for example. And I think uh, Jose with the last uh, slides. Uh, address that that issue, right? Uh, so we are seeking a redefinition of uh, of resilience, a just resilience. Um, That's right. Yeah. Does anybody, if you would like to write your question um, in the uh, in the chat, you can also uh, write it there. Every, we're keeping a good eye on the chat as well. So I will answer all these questions about the organization of, of uh, the school a little bit later, okay? Uh, let's let's uh, concentrate now on questions about the lecture. So uh, while we're waiting for any questions to come in, uh, just to recap, um, to summarize uh, what we uh, just discussed. So we started by just introducing the concept of resilience um, although there are many definitions of resilience coming from many different fields of research and uh, work in the field, um, we uh, wanted to highlight the engineering-based definition. So how we look at um, the solutions that we design and we implement in order to um, the physical systems in our cities that we uh, implement in order to either prevent a, a, a major shock on our uh, urban systems or to mitigate the impact, um, so to, to lessen the impact, or to adapt our urban systems in order to be able to cope uh, better with uh, future shocks on the system. Um, but as we've already mentioned, this is quite a limited view and already people in the conversation are um, being rightfully uh, a bit critical of this uh, limited engineering-based view. So when we bring in the topic of justice, uh, this uh, is a, a critical um, factor to consider how our engineered uh, solutions may impact positively or negative, negatively society. 
And then another important question is on the economic impacts. Can, uh, are these solutions that we can afford? Are these solutions that uh, will um, equally benefit people um, that can be distributed uh, in an equal way? So those are the things that we would like to now um, apply with you in um, a more interactive uh, way, uh, format of education. So we'd like to actually open up um, our, our game-based exercise with an introduction to uh, the exercise. But I see a question. There is a question from Anna in the chat. Anna, you can also say it. Oh, okay. Because yeah. I tried, I, I tried writing it, but it was. A, it's. I think it's easier to ask. So Jose Carlos, I think he explained that it was a bit um, incompatible that uh, like this idea of efficiency and in sustainable urban development with a uh, redundancy, and this is something I I've been working on in my PhD because, for example, during. COVID, it's been um, shown that places that had like multiple uh, open spaces and that had multiple uh, cent uh, health centers uh, scattered all over the city have worked much more efficiently to deal with COVID because COVID is something that, um, that um, expands uh, if people get together. So I would like to know why his um, or why the theory uh, emphasizes this efficiency with like not being linked to redundancy because as far as I understand uh, wow. we are now um, experiencing how no, no, this is I not like that and I uh, would like to know sorry like no, there I was somebody ask... with the with their uh, microphone open, but that's fine. Oh. Go on. Uh, uh, summarize your question, Anna. Uh, I'm very mad <laughs> at that. <laughs> so the link between efficiency and redundancy in sustainable urban planning. If if Jose Carlos could please um, yeah, explain uh, it a bit more on how we can actually use it to make just uh, choices in planning. Yeah, in few words, I think that there, there are compromises to be made there. Basically, uh, of course, you need to cater to the needs of people, uh, not only to the resilience of systems, so to speak, you know. Uh, uh, that's why in COVID it uh, has been extremely important to count with multiple facilities, a diversity of means, you know, to attend all everyone. But if that comes at the expense of sustainability, of course, everyone could have a hospital next to his house, you know, or her house, you know, but we cannot have thousands of hospitals in every neighborhood. You know what I mean? So it's not economically, it's Is unnecessary. It's not economically or... efficient, as someone also said in the chat, and it's very unsustainable. So uh, there are, there will be, have to be compromises in there. Thank you. Compromises and trade-offs, right? So we 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 give a little bit there, so we get a little bit uh, there. So these trade-offs are important, I guess, right? Uh, Semyon, uh, would you like to uh, say your your question? Uh, okay, uh, Jose, uh, Carissa, thank you for your presentation. You know, uh, you you told told about uh, redundancy as a criteria of uh, of uh, resilience, but uh, I know uh, in Russia we have a big problem of uh, redundancy of uh, engineering infrastructures, and uh, these uh, redundant infrastructures um, have to be financed by uh, local authorities, and it's a very big problem. So, how we can find the balance between uh, between uh, resilience, that is really a big uh, problem for, for the future, and uh, economic effectiveness of this, uh, this uh, approach. Shall I take this uh, question? Sorry, I didn't see who uh, asked it, but thank you for your question. Um, I, I'm going to give you maybe the, the more difficult <laughs> response uh, to digest, but um, I would say that um, part of the uh, answer is uh, zooming out and um, trying to understand more about uh, trying to look at resilience in a more holistic way, which is a big effort that um, 
that resilience researchers are doing across the uh, yeah, globally, but I can give you the example of here in the Netherlands, uh, we have a consortium of our, all of our technical universities um, coming together on the topic of uh, resilience because it is a super wicked problem. Um, if you're not familiar with the term, it's uh, wicked problems, but super wicked are very time critical, like climate change. And they um, are solutions at the moment may not be particularly rational in a long-term sort of sense. So this is why they are super wicked. Um, and the, um, the reason I say this is because um, as, we, uh, as resilience research becomes a more mature field, uh, we're, we're looking at how we can better break down our silos and um, integrate our knowledge in order to come up with more intelligent solutions and to have better understandings of interdependencies uh, of our systems that we're trying to protect, but also the systems that create the shocks and the stresses on our uh, human-based systems. So I think that the, it's, it's really a, a complex uh, question at our issue at the heart of your question, and there's no simple solution, but more understanding is, uh, and a more holistic understanding is an important first step. Well, we have a question from uh, Olue Bube, uh, but uh, before let's uh, go to Edgar Lushashu. Uh, he's, he's asking uh, us, uh, you to explain what redundancy is uh, in simple terms. I'm sorry I didn't make it simple, but let's say we have two points to be connected, that is two cities. We can connect them by road. And if we are afraid that one of the roads will be flooded, we can put another road. But of course, although that brings you more possibilities when one road falls, the other may fall as well. We may want you know, to, to eliminate the common cause of failure. That is, instead of having just one road and another road, add another means of transport, a different one between both cities that can be like a, a railroad a railway a railroad right? that can be airplanes uh, fl regular flights that can be sea short sea shipping whatever short sea uh, routes that is the idea of redundancy not only duplicating connections but also providing different means for connecting and and providing the service whatever service you are talking about energy transport so uh, uh, just to make it super clear, uh, uh, you can think of, of um, uh, you know, don't put all your eggs in the same basket, but if you have two baskets and they both fall, the, the eggs will all break, right? If you have somewhere else to put uh, uh, the eggs, maybe they will not break. So redundancy is basically repeating something in order to make it safer to have two of the same is an example, but sometimes having two of the same is not enough. Do I explain it correctly? <laughs> um, Roberto, uh, just to, to let you know, we uh, may need to wrap this part up to have sufficient time for a break and a, um, the exercise. Yeah. Uh, guys, thank you so much. Uh, how much. How much time do we do, do, we do the break? Uh, well, at first, uh, I'd like while everybody's here, um, I'd like to do the introduction to the exercise in two parts. Um, All right. Um, so I'll give a, a brief presentation of the exercise, and then we can all go take a a, a break to refresh and to find ourselves uh, in the Miro board where we're going to collaborate. Um, so I'll explain that um, further. But Jose, did you have any last comments before we end the theoretical part of our? No. Okay, then I'll just uh, jump in with sharing my slides. So I mentioned, let's see, just a moment. So I mentioned that uh, the um, Dutch technical universities are collaborating on the topic of resilience. And um, we have uh, recently completed an education project on urban resilience. Uh, I'll share the link with you later because we have um, more than 140 open access educational resources. If you're really curious about the topic, you can go there. 
download it without any um, um, need to sign in or log in. It's just free to access. Um, and one of the things that we created together um, as a community of four universities was a game called Relasticity. And while we can't play the game online, that would be uh, Im quite impossible to do, uh, we've uh, tried to cre create a fun game-based activity to um, help you better understand um, this uh, relationship between resilience, resilience measures, and um, social justice. At the same time, this is a really um, unique opportunity for us with uh, so many of you coming from what, 73 countries around the world, so many different contexts um, to also understand uh, and learn from you. So um, the, the uh, main objectives of the exercise are um, really to embed a bit more uh, what we've already taught you on the theoretical side about um, um, engineered uh, resilience measures, the relationship, how we can maybe better improve uh, those by adding this uh, uh, social justice lens. So applying a better understanding of distributive and intergenerational justice, uh, and also to um, gain an, an integrated view of the relationship between the measure, the resilience measures that we design and implement, what they cost, what and what their impacts are, for example, on our economy, on nature, on society, and who really benefits from these measures that we implement. This is just a very general conceptual model of the game. So you have an urban system that consists of multiple subsystems like energy, water, the built environment, and um, transport, which is what we have in the game. Um, you have shocks and stresses that are impacting those systems, and you have to implement measures in order to deal with those shocks and stresses. Uh, and your measures have different impacts that um, in the game, we measure them very generally by economy, community, and nature. This is what the activity looks like. Uh, take a moment to uh, have a panic, and then rest assured that we are gonna walk you step-by-step through the exercise. Um, we're going to work on an online whiteboard uh, where you can go in, um, you can navigate around using your cursor or your keyboard, um, and you can, um, yeah, contribute uh, by uh, typing, adding notes uh, to the exercise. And we'll also break it out into uh, groups of five or six people. So we're 165 people, but we will work in small groups. Um, we'll stay uh, on the Zoom call and we'll um, send you to breakout rooms on the call for that group-based exercise. Um, there are 42 groups, so um, we, they will be small groups and they're clustered together by seven different shocks. So you can see here in green, um, all of these groups will work with this, um, deal with the same shock. Maybe it's heavy rain, maybe it's a traffic jam, Maybe it's a, a flood or a dam break. Um, so that's a, your group will work with one shock only. And uh, let's see, on the left-hand side, you can see that there's a warm-up area. So when you come back from the break, you can go and learn some useful information uh, or you can go answer our warm-up warm question. And then after the exercise, which is in the middle there with all the different colors, then uh, we'll wrap up with a debrief uh, where we all come together again into one big group and uh, we'll have a conversation, hopefully a very nice one. Should we, um, just one yeah. question, Carissa, should we give the, the uh, link right now so people can have a look? Sure, yeah, yeah, go on in. Okay, Ugo, you can uh, post the link. Let's, uh, just to give you a warning though, please be very careful. Hopefully things are locked, but uh, just be very careful. Uh, if you've never used um, the Miro board before, there's uh, in really big letters, some very useful um, commands in order to undo something you didn't mean to do or to zoom in and zoom out of the board. So the, the, uh, the thing is, uh, well, uh, before we have a very short break, I want to thank, uh, Jose and Carissa, super uh, 
a lot for for helping us with understanding just uh, just uh, uh, just resilience. And uh, thank you so much. Uh, uh, the, uh, especially the Miro board took a long a lot of energy to prepare. So we have to be really careful not to erase stuff in the Miro board, right? And if you erase something by accident, you can always go Control Z, and then uh, it goes back one step. Uh, for now, we are going to have a three, five minute break, three minute break, is that fine? It's called a, a comfort break. And then we will be back here at uh, 19, at uh, 35, 35, okay? See you, thanks a lot, Jose, thanks a lot, Carissa. I see a lot of people already on the Miro board, which is great. If you have any questions, uh, I'm here and just uh, open your microphone and you can ask me.